Okay. Thank you very much for uh, your attendance. Um, the President of the General Assembly, Mr. Mons Lukatov, is going to brief, brief you on the process uh, to select and appoint the next Secretary General of the United Nations and, uh, uh, and uh, explain how that's going to work. So without further ado, Mr. Lukatov. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I think you were all aware of that what we are embarking on now is an unprecedented transparency in the process of selecting the next Secretary General of the United Nations. There have been uh, initiatives before for this kind of process, but it never worked. It never was put in work on earlier occasions. Now, it's going on, actually. It's happening. Uh, and I think this is quite historic and potentially, of course, game-changing for the way the Secretary-General is point appointed. Uh, I think you have seen, we have at least placed it on our website, the letter I sent out yesterday to all the membership of the United Nations uh, and at the same time, I sent a similar letter to the six officially announced candidates about the procedure uh, we are going to follow. You may know that there are six officially announced candidates at the moment, all of them from Eastern Europe, three of them female, three of them male. It's uh, the, the, the former foreign minister and PGA, actually also from uh, the uh, former Yugoslav uh, Republic of, Ma of Macedonia, uh, Srian Kerim. It's the former foreign minister of Croatia, Vesna Pusic. It's the former state president of uh, Slovenia, Danilo Turk. It's the Foreign Minister of Montenegro, Igor Luxis. Uh, it's the Director General of UNESCO, uh, Irina Bokova of Bulgaria. And it's uh, Natalia German, the Foreign Minister of Moldova. They're on the website behind you, sir. Uh, yeah, you have all the pictures there. Maybe you cannot see all the, the letters. But those are the six we know of, uh, officially, and I think we also know that more will be coming uh, in the next few weeks, probably two more. Uh, but uh, so far, these six candidates, which were duly circulated to the membership, uh, and there is this pay, uh, page on my website that provides the names and other relevant documents for the public and the press. And, and we, of course, we update this website with any future candidate presented. Uh, it's uh, now organized that we will begin meetings, informal dialogue with the candidates uh, on the Tuesday the 12th, Wednesday the 13th, and Thursday the 14th of April. And this will provide candidates the opportunity to present their candidatures and provide member states for the opportunity to ask questions and uh, interact with the candidates. There will be a two-hour slot for each of them by their own uh, in the presentation. It will be an open, informal, transparent dialogue uh, Kept, uh, keep in mind that there is strong interest from the global public and the civil society. Uh, and we will ask uh, the candidates to provide a short vision statement, written statement in advance of up to 2,000 words. And we will give them a 10-minute uh, oral statement at the beginning before the questions are coming in. Uh, and... Uh, 
the, 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 the written uh, vision statement will be circulated to member states and the public uh, in advance. During uh, the informal dialogue, member states will have the opportunity to ask questions to the candidates and will also, time permitting, give uh, representatives from civil society a possibility at the end. Uh, and the meetings will be open and webcasted and we'll post each webcast on the website. Uh, all this, of course, was started by the General Assembly Resolution 69-321 uh, to uh, this whole process. I, can, I consider the informal dialogues an important step forward towards the, the transparency we have asked for in, in, in a lot of areas. I expect that it will be in the interest of whoever becomes Secretary General in January 2016 to have met with the membership of the United Nations through this informal dialogues which are called for in the resolution and by called for also by the global uh, public. I think this is about the framework, and I, I'm sure you have some questions about... Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, and, uh, and, and just since we have the screen, I can show the, uh, uh, the NGLS website as well, um, which has just gone live. Uh, this, is, uh, this is full of uh, innovation, which NGLS can... Uh, can explain in how members uh, uh, from civil society can engage in this uh, in this uh, this process and uh, propose propose questions. Uh, let's have some questions. A question over there, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Masood Heather. I represent Daily Dawn newspaper of Pakistan on behalf of UN Correspondent Association. I'd like to welcome you to this press conference. Sir, can you please tell me? Uh, is there a hard and fast rule uh. that you un that you understand? Is there that uh, besides the uh, East European, there's no other candidate who can come in? Number one. Number two. Can you also <clears throat> tell me in this vetting process that is going on now, will does the Security Council has the last say in this, or does the uh, do the member states? in the General Assembly have uh, sway over there at all? Can you tell me that? Thank you, sir. I'll try to. Um, I'm not quite sure I understood the first part of your question. Uh, You're asking about the regional rotation? Or? The regional, that was about, okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, the regional, there, there's no regulations about regional rotation. Uh, but there is, of course, a strong uh, uh, group arguing for a regional rotation and saying that Eastern Europe is the only of the five groups that uh, has not yet been able to select a, a Secretary General. There's no regulation either about gender, but we know there is a very strong group uh, over all the, the different regional groups arguing for this being the occasion of selecting the first female. Secretary General. About the, the, the division of labor between the Security Council and the General Assembly in this, I think the formality is very short, very brief, namely that it's a, an election made by the General Assembly in, uh, after a proposal brought forward by the Security Council. That's the only thing we, we have written down. Of course, uh, 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 and that's why it, it is, in a way, uncharted territories that the, the uh, General Assembly takes upon it to have these informal uh, uh, dialogues with the candidates brought forward even before the Security Council starts. It's selection process. But, 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 but yes, it's, it, the, it's the prerogative of the Security Council to bring a name or more names forward to be voted on in the General Assembly.
but it is the final decision is in the General Assembly. And, 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 I, and I think, and I've said that on several occasions, is this a game-changing uh, procedure? We don't know. Uh, it, 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 it's very simple to me that it could be a game-changing procedure if the membership in general uh, gather around one candidate. More or less, there's a critical mass of member states gathering around one candidate. Then I think it will be difficult to see the Security Council coming up later with quite a different name. But, 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 but we have seen on earlier occasions is, of course, that because of, of the procedures uh, and while there were no a kind of informal dialogues in the GA hall before, uh, it has been very much historically up to the permanent five of the Security Council to find the name. Uh, the, just a follow up. The, the yeah. Security Council process, the vetting process, is very secretive and it's not uh, transparent. Is, can there be a movement or can there be consideration on, the, on behalf on, uh, in the General Assembly that this process can be made more transparent and whether these uh, candidates can come up in General Assembly and make their cases and so forth? or they can be back and forth between them. Is that the uh, process that can be considered? Well, well it's my, my firm uh, expectation that each and every candidate will be presented in the General Assembly uh, during this procedure. And I, 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 I really encourage all member states having candidates uh, or considering candidates to bring them forward so we can have them all presented in April, I cannot guarantee that, but but uh, but because there's no t time limit in the resolution for na bringing names, but I, I it's my firm uh, intention to make sure that every candidate is presented also to the General Assembly in this procedure. Thank no you. hard and fast rule that there should be a women Sir. candidate this time. There's no hard and fast rule that right. there is going to be a woman who will be selected as the Secretary General of the United Nations. Is there? It's up to the interaction between the Security Council and the membership to decide that. It's not up to me. Very good. There's a follow-up question follow -up. here, and then yes. I'm going to come to you. Th thank uh, you very much. Uh, follow-up. Mr. President, you're, you're saying that pretty much the, you're, you do not expect the P5 to use their veto powers just to uh, maybe uh, withhold it? Well, what I'm saying is that I think there is a an opportunity, not any kind of, of, of security for the membership to have much more influence than before. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Th this opens up for, for, for the possibility, but it depends very much on how uh, they use this opportunity. Uh, and, and, and I think in formal terms, it's very, very questionable that the, there is any kind of veto power on a procedural issue like appointing the, the, the Secretary General. But in praxis, there have been this respect for a, a, a unanimity between the permanent five. Sir, your question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, President Ligatoft, at the outset, uh, I wish to uh, acknowledge uh, that uh, your uh, delivery of the uh, ongoing transparency uh, has been unprecedented, uh, and this is uh, definitely greatly respected. With regard to the, the, the selection process and the uh, sessions which are going to be held between the 12th to the 14th of April, why the media uh, or interaction between the candidates and the media is not included in that? Uh, since the NGOs, uh, civil society mm. is going to be involved, the member states are going to be involved, why not the media uh, be involved uh, still within... Who's within saying the media won't be involved? We would be covering others. But What's your question, sir? 
<laughs> Ask the question and the president will answer. I think whatever the question... Why, why there is no answer. inclusion of a media uh, yeah. a briefing with the candidates, uh, similar to the NGO uh, briefings that uh, the civil societies are going to be able uh, to uh, cast their questions well, directly well, to the candidates. First of all, there will be an opportunity after the two-hour slot in the GA for a press takeout with each and every candidate after that. So the media will have the possibility to meet with the candidates yeah. and ask them questions after they've been in the uh, meeting with the, with the membership, which will take part in the trusteeship uh, uh, council. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and maybe I should add, I, I, I for sure expect that this is only, so to say, the, the uh, official framework for announcing candidates. There will be a lot of other encounters with the candidates. NGO organizations and so on will, will arrange meetings. The media will be present. I expect also that the Swedish Council will have their own meetings after uh, the, uh, the presentation in the GA in, in different formats, uh, not necessarily closed sessions, but that's up to them. Uh, to decide. Uh, we have only our procedures in our hand in the GA. But, but, but uh, th there will be a lot of opportunities for the media to meet and ask questions with the candidates, I'm sure. Very good. There's a question uh, from the lady there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Olga Denisova, RIA Novosti, Russian News Agency. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, have you already met with um, all of the candidates and um, uh, how do you see the meeting of the candidates with the members of the Security Council? Maybe uh, it'll be the meeting of all the six or it'll be more uh, candidates with uh, here in New York with the members of the Security Council. And when will you start this process of meetings or consultations? With the security, in the Security Council you're asking? Um, it should be meetings of uh, candidates and uh, members of the Security Council yeah. uh, and you also. But I, I, I am not uh, aware of what, uh, what kind of proceedings they will have in the Security Council. I don't think they have decided upon that yet. I have been in close contact with the presidents over the last month of the Security Council, including the present one from Venezuela. Uh, in order to inform the Security Council on precisely what we are doing. And uh, as I understand it, they have not made up their minds yet how to go on with specific consultations with the candidates in the Security Council. But I uh, expected that to happen. But, but, but I don't know about any details because they have not decided yet as far as I know. Yeah. Uh, uh, and there was another question. Uh, Have you personally met with some of the candidates? Yes, I m met with all of them on different occasions. Uh, uh, as late as uh, this week, I met with three of them uh, uh, presenting themselves. But I met with all of them now. Yes, sure. Thanks a lot. <coughs> Sorry. Thanks a lot. Matthew Lee, Inner City Press, on behalf of the Free UN Coalition for Access, thanks for this briefing and for the process. Uh, I wanted to ask about, I guess, disclosures uh, in, in general, but about. For example, of the candidates, some of the prior criticism of prior races has been that candidates from larger countries can spend more, that their foreign ministry can support them making grants. And I'm not saying it's illegal, but I guess I'm wondering, do you have any thoughts in terms of applying the level of scrutiny that, that a lot of campaign structures in the U.S. and other countries have to having the candidates disclose money spent to support their candidacy? And I also, with all due respect to Irina Bakova, I wanted to ask you whether you have any thoughts of current U.N. officials that have a travel budget, a staff, a, you know, a spokespeople, either not using that to, to give them an upper hand or in some way disclosing what's being s been spent. And just finally, since others have asked uh, questions, I, I wanted to ask about your own, tr the trip that you made to Morocco. It's a very simple question that I did ask in writing, but I'm going to ask it now orally since I didn't get an answer. Did you raise the issue of Western Sahara while you were there, given that it's on the General Assembly's agenda, the Secretary General raised it, and can you explain why this trip was paid for by Morocco, but your trip to other countries in Europe uh, came out of the UN budget? Thanks. Well, yes, let me take the, uh, the so to say, outside the, the agenda questions at once. Uh, paying, uh, we accept 
any kind of <laughs> paying for our travels because we have a very small uh, budget. So if we are invited to a member country on a good occasion, we were invited to Morocco because they have in their hand the COP22. Uh, uh, well, we re receive that and we disclose that, as you know. Uh, so there's no, uh, no other uh, uh, argument about that. And um, what, what uh, I'm wondering one thing about you, okay. and that is, uh, why didn't you ask that question on Western Sahara before you wrote on your website? That I, I probably did. wouldn't you can have check. raised that question. I raised that question exactly with the wording of the decisions of the United Nations in my meeting with the Vice Foreign Minister of Morocco. No, I'm glad what? to hear it, but I'd like you to know I did email these questions to Dan, Ula. I did it all before I wrote the article, so I just, maybe there's some uh, problem electronically, but they, they, these were asked, no. and it remains outstanding. But thanks for your answer now. Yeah. But can you say what about disclosures by candidates of money being spent in their, in their uh, campaigns? Well, uh, yes, I, I see your your I see your question raised. I mean, it's a it's a problem in each and every election campaign that not all countries, not all candidates, uh, uh, command the same resources, and and I, I I don't see that it is within my competence to write rules and regulations about it. Uh, I, I I see the problem, and I see uh, you ask in particular about candidates being. Uh, uh, high staff um, members in, in the UN organizations. Uh, I think it's up to the UN organization themselves to make regulations on that if they seem it's, it's, it's uh, uh, reasonable to do it. Uh, we have had, uh, there's no doubt that you can be a candidate at the same time as you are in a UN organization. I think Kofi Annan was in the same position some years ago. So, but, but, but the rest of it is not within my reach of competence. But will you be asking the question? This is my final question. Will you, as, would you, do, you, do you think it's a reasonable question that you and others that get to ask questions to the candidates, we may or may not at a stakeout, would ask sort of just routinely of all of them, who's paying for the campaign? Could you have corporate sponsors of a campaign? I mean, I'm just using that hypothetically. But. Yeah, but, uh, if I were you, I would raise that question. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Any other <laughs> questions for the president on this uh, issue of the selection process of the next Secretary General? Okay. Thank you very much. Now, you've, you've had four questions already. <laughs> one more? Okay. Let's make it five. Just one thing. What, what you have seen in the past is that once the Security Council recommends a candidate, and that uh, becomes fine. Yeah. Is that going to be the case again this time? Well, I don't know, and I can't, don't command this, the Security Council. What I know is two things are in discussion in the GA still. We got this consensus resolution uh, uh, 321 in the last session, which we are following now, implementing now. But there were two questions raised in the discussion already in the last session and still alive among many member states. And the one, one of them being, will the General Assembly want the next Secretary General to be elected only for one prolonged period without the possibility of re-election? And the other question being, should the Security Council bring forward more than one uh, person for the decision in the GA? And, 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 and it is, in a way, uh, something that the majority in the GA and the Security Council will have to decide on, the one and the second. Uh, but finally, you can say, formally, uh, the, 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 the General Assembly can, can, of course, I don't think that will happen. I don't think it would be appropriate that it happened. But the, the, the GA can vote down every proposal until they get one that, 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 that uh, they will accept constitutionally. Another thing is what will be appropriate, what will be useful uh, in order to, to give the maximum 
calm and support and strength for the next Secretary General. And I, I hope that the General Assembly and the Security Council will find out a balance that gives us the best, the strongest, the most competent candidate uh, elected. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. If you have any questions about the process, then Susan from NGLS is here. So.